you said something earlier, and I should have picked up on it then. You said that you go to Mexico currently. I know at one point our government denied our government, your bosses at the time, denied that you were given the order to kidnap that doctor. Um, the doctor officially, eventually stands trial here in the U.S. The case is thrown out. He's sent back to Mexico, and the Mexican government takes out a warrant for your arrest for kidnapping. And you were left out there in the wind. Does that warrant not stand anymore? Uh, what happened, uh, the warrant uh, expired. At, the warrant was only good for 20 years. It, it expired in 2013. That's when the warrant expired. But yes, I was wanted in Mexico, and I couldn't go to Mexico at all. I had a warrant for my arrest. The Mexicans, Mexicans put my warrant in Interpol, meaning that I couldn't go into any other foreign countries. I couldn't go to Canada. Because I wasn't in Interpol. They would, if I went to Canada, the Canadians would have to arrest me and turn me over to the Mexicans. So I couldn't leave the country for 20 years while that warrant was outstanding. Now, it, ex it has expired already. But yes, I was ordered to kidnap that doctor by the director of the DEA, Jack Lon, in front of two other uh, a, uh, 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 DEA employees, Doug Hill, and the deputy director of the DEA, uh, I forget his last name, but, I was, but anyway, he was there. I was ordered to kidnap the doctor. But to this day, Jack Lon says he never ordered it. I was thrown under the bus. So after the, I kidnapped the doctor and he appeared his initial appearance before a U.S. magistrate, it went, went world news that this doctor had been kidnapped by the DEA. When the DEA was approached, the, uh, the uh, press information officer, Frank Schultz, stated the kidnapping of the doctor was orchestrated by a rogue renegade agent, Hector Berreas, without headquarters knowledge nor authorization. That's why the Mexican government was quick to get an arrest warrant for my arrest. Jack Lund, the director of DEA, denied that he ordered me to do it and denies to this day, Sean, that he ordered me to kidnap that doctor. And that's a fact. Uh, so I got to ask you, why, why do you think, because, because you have been very vocal, very out front, um, and very forthcoming with information that shines a terrible light on the U.S. government. Why weren't you extradited back to Mexico? Why do you think they allowed you to stay here in the U.S. and just live out your days? Because I stayed quiet all the time that the war in Mexico was outstanding, I didn't come out and say anything because I was told when I retired, I was given my retirement and I was told, go enjoy your life, keep your mouth shut. You don't want to upset your own government because you might end up in a Mexican prison because you're wanted over there. And you know that in Mexico, you wouldn't last three days alive in a prison. You would be killed. So enjoy your retirement, keep your mouth shut, be a good soldier and, and basically enjoy life. But I couldn't say anything while I had the warrant outstanding. I waited till it expired. An interview that I had with Megyn Kelly was the first time that I involved CIA complicity in Camarena's murder in 2013. If you go back and check that interview, that was the first time. Her jaw dropped. She almost fell out of the chair when I said that the, that the CIA was complicit in Camarena's murder. I, th I think everybody's jaw dropped hearing your story, whether it's the first time or the fifth time. It, it, do we know our government is capable? Absolutely. But it is rare, if ever, that somebody like yourself, who was on the inside, 
who were part of so many special operations can say conclusively, I have firsthand knowledge that our government turned on one of its citizens, one of its agents for that matter. You, you never see that and it is so hard to believe. Uh, to this day, do you walk in fear? Do, uh, are you afraid that one day you'll go to a restaurant? I mean, we see how Putin uh, tends to eliminate opponents of him and the government over in Russia. They, they'll, they'll ingest poison and just come down with, oh, it's COVID. But really, it's something far more sinister. Do you worry that that's your fate? Because you are not only telling your story, but you're attaching your face to it. You're attaching your name. It's not like I'm speaking to you behind a veil and your voice is distorted. Do you worry about repercussion? You know, Sean, I've lived in fear most of my life. Yes, I live in fear. To me, fear is second nature anymore. When I was with DEA, I was in fear all the time. I actually thought that I might not get to retire, that I would be killed because I was being sent on all these operations in Central, South America, Mexico. I actually thought that I might not retire. Okay, so I lived in fear. And anybody that tells you that, that, that they're not afraid, I was scared. Excuse the expressing shitness a lot of times when I was in the cover that I was going to be exposed and be killed and dumped somewhere and never be found. Of course. And I live in fear now. You don't see me hanging out at no nightclubs, drinking at bars and stuff like that. I'm, I live a very careful life. I have very few friends. And I am always very, very cognizant of my surroundings. I don't frequent one restaurant a lot. So I'm always very careful. And do I live in fear? Yes, I live in fear. And I chose to expose this corruption because I love of humanity and love of my country. I love people, man. And I hate to see our government exploit our people. I hate to see our government provide drugs to our citizens and then arrest them for, 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 for using them or selling them. I hated that. I love the poor guy I grew up poor. I suffer their, 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 I suffer for them. I suffer their pain, Sean. And this is why if I die, then fine. But I'm gonna expose the truth. We created a lot of these problems. Now, like they say, it, it, it's coming back on us. We have all these drug addicted people now. We have all this crime. Oh, why do we have all this crime? We, our government has created a lot of these problems. We have ignored the poor. We have arrested the poor. Okay? I sympathize with a poor guy. I felt sorry for some of the people that I arrested. I grew up with these people at the barrio. I saw they came from uh, drug addicted parents. I knew a lot of them came from, um, you know, no father at home, one mother. The mother was on drugs, getting welfare. What kind of a future do you expect that poor Mexican guy to have? You expect him to, 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 to graduate from Harvard? Are you kidding me? That guy won't make it through high school. And they want to have a car. They want to have what everybody else had. But society never granted him the opportunity. So now he's a big criminal. Let's go put him in jail forever. We need to get the, the family back together. We need to get back to religion. We get to get back to the basics here. Love thy neighbor. Take care of the neighbor. Don't arrest him because he's poor. Don't make him become a criminal. You think all these kids that are that are committing all these crimes right now, they want to be that? They're hungry. They want to eat. They want to have what everybody else has. And I'm not excusing them. But I have to also blame our government for not taking care of them and creating this problem. That's why I'm, I expose all this stuff. I've stated it before in, your, in the last interview I did. I liked a lot of the guys that I was having to arrest. I was undercover with them. I drank with them. I ran with them. 
And you know what? At the end, when I had to arrest them, I felt sorry for them. A lot of them even apologized to me because they liked me as a person. They liked me and they apologized to me and they said even they were sorry. And one day a criminal was telling me that in front of my supervisor. And I said, I told my supervisor, I feel sorry for the guy. Look, he's going to go away for 25 years at least. I feel sorry for him. He liked me. He said, no, Hector, he didn't like you. He liked Manuel Lizarraga, your undercover a person. He doesn't like you. I said, that's hard to cope with. I said, I can't wrap that around my brain. He liked my undercover persona, but he doesn't like me. I think he still likes me. He does know who I am, and he's apologizing to me. I don't I don't think I agree with you. He says, no, he doesn't like you. He liked that undercover guy that you, you kicked it around with him, you drank with him, and you partied with him. You bought dope from him more than once, and now you arrest him, and now. I said, but I like the guy, too. And I'll tell you, I like some of the guys that I arrested more than some of the guys that I worked with. And there is loyalty out in the streets. They protect each other down there. They got each other's back. In government, nobody had my back. Look at me, they threw me under the damn bus. What loyalty is that I have from my own government? They don't like me talking like I'm talking right now. But you know what? I live in fear. And if I have to die, at least I told my story. And there are other DEA guys like me, not just me. They won't say it publicly, but they got to like the people that they were undercover. Did you ever watch the movie Donnie yes, Brasco? Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, FBI. Well, Joe Pistone and I are friends. You know, Joe Pistone was fired from the FBI. He never got a retirement from the FBI. And he told me, I felt bad when I arrested all those mafia guys. I felt bad because you know what? Those guys took me in. They liked me. They took care of me. And yes, I was undercover into them for six years, and I knew at the end they were all going to be arrested. And you know what, Hector, he says, I know you You agree with me because you were long-term undercover too. We get to like some of these guys, didn't we? And I said, yes, we did. And I told him, I said, I like some of those guys. I arrested more than some of the people that I worked with. They, they had never had my back. They didn't take care of me. But those guys, a lot of them take care of each other in their criminality, in, their, in, the, in the lives they live. Basically, I love humanity, and I hate to see our government, you know, not take care of its citizens. And I will repeat, government's first priority should be the protection of its citizens. Uh, before I let you go, I got a couple more questions for you. Uh, you speak okay. about government. What do you think about all that's going on with Trump? And do you think he will ever return to the White House. You know, Trump is a very controversial person. Con Trump was not ever a politician. That's why they were able to insert Trojan her horses into Trump's campaign. A lot of the people that, that, that Trump was told to basically assign as FBI directors or attorney generals, they were enemies of Trump's. They stuck in these Trojan horses. Comey was not a friend of a, a, a loyal or a friend of Trump's. He was an enemy of Trump. Ray is not an enemy of Trump. The attorney general is not an enemy of Trump. But a lot of these guys were appointed by Trump. That's what that's what people don't understand. He took the advice of the people and they betrayed Trump. Excuse me, they betrayed Trump. Trump is not a political figure. Say what you will about him. He came in, he saw the corruption, he saw the swamp, and he tried to clean the swamp. So now they're after him. I don't know if he's going to make it, but they have set a very bad president. Are we now going to allow parties, political parties, to arrest their enemies just because they're enemies and protect criminality just because they're friends. And this is what we're seeing right now. Like Trump or not like Trump, this is bad what's going on right now. This should never happen in a civilized society. We're no better than Venezuela, 
who Maduro got rid of, of his political opponent because he won the election and wanted to stay in power. Gardino, that one won the election, is not even in Miami, exiled in Miami because Maduro was going to kill him. That was his political enemy. Okay? We're no better than, 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 than the third world countries now where they do that. The guy comes into power and he starts arresting all of his political enemies and killing them too. That's really bad. Right or, right or wrong, this should not be happening in our country. And our country should not, our administrators should not weaponize government agencies to go against political enemies. That is very, very wrong. To use the IRS to go against somebody because they're not of their political affiliation. To target those people. Go after them. See what you can find in them. Arrest them. To use the FBI to go raid somebody's house. A political enemy. But yet other people are doing it, but you won't raid their houses. Okay, to use to to to, to use uh, all the, the the CIA and all these intelligence agencies to cover up, to cover up evidence, because they're loyal to one political party, that is corruption, John, and that should not be happening in our country. If Trump is arrested, it's, he's only going to be arrested and convicted, because they, the political party now, does not want him to come into power. What's going to happen if the Republicans come in power and they start doing that next to start arresting other Democrats? That is bad. I've never thought that our country would get to this point in its corruption. And this is all corruption. That's all we do. You know, I, I find it very interesting, um, you know, because you, you clearly, as you mentioned several times, this is not political for you. Um, I, 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 you, you see things through a lens of right and wrong, and you see things through a lens of basic humanity, which I applaud you for. Um, I, I, I wonder what is your thoughts? Because I remember when Trump ran in 2015 um, for the 2016 election, he he was very hard on. Uh, the citizens of Mexico. Uh, he ran on the, the the promise that he was going to put up a border, um, and it felt like he he lumped all Mexicans, whether they were hardworking or whether they were traffickers, he lumped them all in one bowl. But there were still so many Latinos. Um, and Mexicans specific who voted for him. How do you make sense of that being a, a, a man from the barrio yourself um, with roots directly into Mexico and knowing what you know from both sides of, of your life, one of which you're just an ordinary citizen and another of which you have worked so hard um, on the side of law enforcement on behalf of this country and this government. I did not like those remarks by Trump when he said them. I don't believe that he meant to say that all Mexicans were criminals and rapists and whatever he said. I think he just misspoke. I think he was talking about a lot of these illegals that are coming in that are criminals, and a lot of them are coming in that were rapists and murderers or whatever, they were wanted for murder here, kill somebody here, go back to Mexico for a couple of years, then come back. A lot of them are. I believe that the Mexicans and Hispanics love Trump and voted for Trump because Trump is pro-religion. He is pro-family. There are a lot of things that Trump is for that Mexicans identify with. Mexicans are very pro-family and very pro-religion. They don't like all this stuff about uh, go undercover into the church and find out what the church is doing. And, and uh, they also respect education like Mexicans do. 
they don't like uh, uh, basically what they see is uh, arresting arresting parents because they're protesting against the school and stuff like that that's, that's gone on. So therefore, a lot of Mexicans and a lot of Hispanics are going to support Trump in this next election. If he gets to be there, if they don't destroy him and put him in jail where he can't run anymore, which is what the objective is now. They want to put him in jail right now so he will not make it. They're trying to destroy him so that he doesn't become president. And I believe that the only reason they're doing it is because they fear Donald Trump. They're afraid of Donald Trump. I really believe that. That's the only reason they, they, they put up, what, 90-some charges against, felony charges against him, or charges that everybody else has, has done before. Nobody ever would charge with those, those, those kind of charges. And the Mexican and Hispanic population can see that. They came from that type of third world country tactics where politicians kill each other, and they came from there. And you're seeing it here. They're running from that, this is Ma these Mexicans and Hispanics, only to come and say, this is no better than where I came from. That's why they're going to, I believe, support Trump. And if Trump is not ruined or not kept from running by the opposition, he is going to have huge support from the Hispanics because of the religion, the family unity that 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 we need, that, that that he uh, basically um, projects, and uh, an education. And those are three big things, especially religion. You can be a criminal. You can be a Chapo Guzman. But, man, he still believes in the Virgin Mary uh, up here in Mexico. He still believes in, 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 in the church. I, I walk around with killers. But they go to church every Sunday, but they'll go out and kill somebody. Seriously. That's one thing about, about, about Hispanic and Mexicans. They are true believers in God. How did I recruit these Sicarios? That, that were involved in Kiki's murder. I told you how I recruited him. I would get him on the phone and say, hey, I need you to come help me. And they said, but you know I was involved in Kiki's murder. I was there. And I said, I, I tell you, I won't arrest you. If you cooperate and become a witness over here, I won't arrest you. He would say, I don't trust you. You're going to arrest me. I was involved. And I would say, listen, do you believe in God? I'm talking to criminals. Yes. Well, if I swear to Jesus Christ that I'm not going to arrest you, would you come? I'm a Catholic. And I go to church every Sunday, and I believe in God, and I fear the Lord. And I'm telling you right now, if you come here, I swear on Jesus Christ's name, I will not arrest you. And they came. That's the only way that I could get a hardcore criminal to come here and cooperate with me, because they are very, very, very believers in, in, in the Lord and in religion. And all this stuff that they're seeing right now here, with all this anti-religion stuff and they hate that. And Donald Trump is pro-religion, and that's why I believe that the majority of Mexicans and Hispanics are going to be on Donald Trump's side come next election if he gets there. You know, that is such an eye-opening statement that you just made. Um, I'm an African-American male, and for the life of me, um, I, I never... I never could understand how um, a race of people could support, which from the outside looking in, with someone who spoke down on them, who lumped them into the same pile, who said things like, you know, there are rapists coming in, and, you know, there are criminals. And, and you really just gave me a, a better understanding of Latinos and Mexicans in particular overall, because I, I really could not. And even as I asked you that question, I, 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 I've been trying to figure it out. So that's such great insight, um, one that I didn't have before this conversation. And I think that there are going to be so many people whose eyes are open, even um, as you spoke to how you were able to get criminals, um, people who protected those who um, kidnapped and participated in the kidnap, kidnapping and interrogation of Kiki Cameron, how you got them to come over and, and work alongside of you was something as simple as speaking to them for, on the level of, of religion in the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, I mean, I, you know, I, such great insight right there. 
Um, by any chance, Hector, do you have your book nearby, The Last Narc? Yes, I do. This is a book that I wrote titled The Last Narc. The Last Narc documentary on Amazon right now uh, basically uh, was based on this book. This is my life story. It starts from how I grew up in the barrios of Mexico, how I got my education, my military background, how I'm a, a veteran of, of the war, and also it, uh, it, 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 it goes into the Camarena murder case, how I developed that case, and basically how I was. I was known as a shooting star of DEA that crashed. And I crashed because I would not sell my moral my morals for promotions or comfort. I had to tell the truth and stay with the truth. And this is what this book is about. Like I said, you can get it on paperback, in Amazon, on sale now. By any chance, are you on social media? Uh, yes. I, well, I'm, I, have, I, I don't have a program on social media yet. But yes, I do have a, um, a website. Do, do you mind sharing it with our audience? Because I know after this interview, there are going to be so many people who want to follow you or want to reach out to you. And I'm going to encourage everybody. That that book, The Last Narc, it is, if you think that this conversation is powerful, that book is beyond powerful. It's hard to manage cartel, cartel madness on YouTube. Cartel madness. They can, they can reach me there. Oh, right on YouTube. YouTube. Got you. Uh, Hector, uh, right. again, th this has been all my pleasure. Uh, I, 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 I enjoyed last time that we had an opportunity to sit, and I really enjoyed taking that conversation and moving it forward. You are an amazing American. Uh, you're a man of principle, a man of morals. And I'm so happy that you're telling your story because you are what is lost in our society. Um, and more people need to look at yourself and your story and the bravery that it's taken for you to do what you're doing and hopefully model their daily lives after you. Um, I, I, I truly thank you, brother. I, I enjoyed our time, and, and I look forward to doing it again. Thank you. I'll, I'm here. Whenever you want to invite me back to your program, I will, I will gladly come back. I love your audience, and I want to thank them for staying with us throughout this interview. Absolutely. Everyone go out and get that book, The Last Narc, and if you want to watch an incredible four-part documentary, um, please head on over to, to Amazon and check out uh, The Last Narc. It, 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 it's deep, and it breaks down the story of Kiki Camarena and also um, Hector's career. Hector, my brother, I thank you. Much love and continued blessings and respect. Love you and your audience. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love. Make every move a power move. And I'll catch you all on the next video.